I'd like to welcome you in particular to the Guarini Institute for Public Affairs, uh, which I'm the director this evening. I have multiple capacity. Primary Italian think tank, and I'm particularly happy to be here and to introduce, uh, introduce uh, the speakers. And uh, spe this special report that is full of uh, stimulating suggestions because uh, contemporary form of slavery, new form of slavery, how to approach this. Just reading the report, uh, I was stimulated by existing elements. There is a very huge phenomenon spread all over the world in the States, uh, which would uh, which contacts. But there is no common definition, there are no sufficient data, there is a monitoring, a problem of monitoring the effects different resolutions and laws and so on. And uh, it's really a challenge to think. Hello, let me introduce uh, uh, the first speaker, it's uh, Professor Silvia Scarpa, One Life on Human Rights, the Library, the Slavery, and so on. That's all, I, I don't want to read uh, all the curricula, but uh, it's a uh, she started years a year ago, ago to work on these issues, and it's an honor, I think, for you to have uh, Silvia Scarpa with you now. Then uh, we have a second speaker, <coughs> Parosha Chandran, professor uh, practice in modern slavery law at King's College. And uh, then the third speaker, Maria Grazia Marinaro, a United Nations Special Rapporteur in Trafficking of Person, in particular Women and Children. And uh, um, Italian Pride, the primary position in Italian Pride. So uh, you have uh, uh, three main uh, speakers. And uh, let's uh, start with Silvia Scarpa. And, uh, I think that, uh, and finish this introduction, 
we can use a uh, um, quotation of Albert Einstein. We cannot solve our problems without the same thinking, way of thinking in which we create it. So if we want to understand how to approach the new form of slavery, we must open our eyes and uh, try to have a different mentality and approach. The floor to Professor Scala. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Dr. Chen. Um, we have been friends since actually I graduated, so I think that the first time we met was because I was actually giving to you my thesis when I graduated. So, uh, really, your words uh, mean a lot actually to me uh, because of this uh, long uh, friendship. Um, let me uh, first of all say that I would like to thank uh, you all for being here today. I would like to thank in particular also our panelists today for having accepted our invitation to join us for discussing about this study. Uh, there are some special guests that we have also from international organizations in Rome, which is very important because it means that probably we're going to start a conversation on how some of these issues that were emphasized in the study uh, might be tackled in an appropriate way. Um, I also would like to thank uh, uh, a few of the people who helped and supported me uh, throughout the drafting uh, uh, process. In particular, uh, Professor Terry Gray, who is visiting professor at the University of uh, Newcastle uh, at Pompeii, um, because he was reviewing the study, so he was an academic reviewer hired by the European Parliament for that purpose. Uh, then we had uh, actually um, a hearing of the subcommittee of human rights in Brussels at the European Parliament. So I would like to thank also the um, president, uh, Pier Antonio Panzeri, uh, of the subcommittee for that invitation for the chance to discuss about the preliminary results of the study, as well as all the members of the European Parliament who attended and uh, contributed you know, to what is actually the outcome, also with their criticism, I would have to say, in some cases. Um, uh, definitely, uh, I have to thank uh, uh, Dr. Marika Lurch, who is the Parliamentary Research uh, Administrator of the European Parliament, um, as well as the staff uh, uh, of TESA, uh, who offered support to, throughout the drafting process. Let me finally also thank uh, the President of John Cambridge University for the chance to organize this event, as well as my colleague uh, and friend, Federico Argentieri, who is the director of the Guarini Institute, uh, for actually the opportunity to have an event, which is actually a special Guarini uh, Institute event. Um, I'm really honored to have the chance to discuss with you uh, about the preliminary results of this um, study. Consider that when uh, last summer um, I was invited actually by the European Parliament to draft this report, uh, they actually asked to me to draft a report which should have been between 10 and 20 pages. And <laughs> the job actually should have lasted a couple of months uh, during the summer. Should have been some kind of a summer job, let's say. Uh, it ended up obviously being something that lasted much more than that. Um, and honestly, uh, the more we went deeper into the analysis, the more I had the impression that this is only the beginning, um, that actually we need to do much more research. And I hope this will be also cooperative research in the near future. I was talking about this to Parosh, and definitely to Maria Grazia uh, as well, as well as to the many uh, uh, experts who are also um, here, and my research uh, assistants as well, uh, uh, who have been doing the research with me uh, this semester. So, Definitely, I think that we started a new phase with the adoption of this report um, that maybe we lead also to other results in the near future in this area. The first issue that I would like to uh, clarify um, in respect actually of uh, this study, uh, and this is actually something that has to do uh, with the terminology which is used. Uh, I'm not actually expressing how the actors in the field of global governance um, label the issue. And what I discovered is that there are a variety of terms that are used in an inconsistent way. So my question was, first of all, to understand whether this was only a semantic problem or whether instead there was you know, a problem which was getting deeper into this area, you know, into then, obviously, 
the common understanding of the issues that we're dealing with, which might lead also to you know, common framework that should be in place for dealing with many of these issues. And what actually I um, concluded, and probably this is the most important conclusion of this study, uh, is that actually there is a lack of clarity on the uh, content of the concept of contemporary forms of slavery which is actually uh, then leading uh, to uh, fundamental problems. First of all, in having a coordinated action among uh, global governance actors in this field. Um, then secondly, this is also problematic actually for collecting data and providing global estimates on this issue. And that issue is particularly important whenever we have to set priorities. Because obviously, if we do not have a clear idea of how big, let's say, certain issues are, we're not going to be able also to um, understand which issue will be more important and relevant. So the priorities will also be uh, set in a way which is probably not fully scientific, you know, in, in terms of the outcome. And then um, definitely this affects negatively also the action in this field uh, because we have a variety of actors, but we do not have a coordinated framework in place. It seems that many different actors are all going. <coughs> In different directions, they all have their own priorities, um, and each one of them is pushing a little bit for their agenda, um, which might be good on one hand, uh, but it obviously would be better if at a certain point we were to come out uh, with further um, conclusions on how we can all work together and how we can set you know, a global agenda in a way set in the framework. Um, the second issue that I uh, was uh, the, emphasizing in this study is a problematic informational law regime existing in this field, which means that we have various treaties that were adopted um, in the area that we label contemporary forms of uh, slavery or contemporary slavery. We were discussing uh, also among us uh, about the appropriate terminology for discussing about that. Um, and we came out also with some, uh, you know, uh, problems in this respect in finding a common framework of, on how to label actually this area. Um, but still, I think it is important to find an agreement also on that huh? because this area will have to be, in a way, another promoted. Uh, so the labels will be important in the end as well. But going back actually to the international law standards, um, we have actually various frameworks in place the slavery framework with conventions. Slavery Convention, which is quite updated in 1926, then was supplemented by um, uh, Supplementary Convention on Slavery, um, which was adopted in 1956, but still the two of them quite old. Um, uh, and also, actually, uh, if you look at that, they lack many uh, of the protective measures which were instead included later on in other frameworks. Now, obviously, I have in mind um, the more recent uh, Council of Europe Convention on Human Trafficking, but also the protocol promoted by the ILO um, uh, to the Forced Labour uh, Convention. Um, when I was studying actually these legal frameworks, two issues came up clearly. The first one was an issue in terms of the interpretation of the labels, let's say. How do we um, define the concepts, concepts of slavery, forced labour, that bondage, and many others that are used uh, within our area of uh, research and action. And the second one was obviously connected with the standards existing for guaranteeing protection usually you know, to victims and whether there was an appropriate framework in place, whether it was a criminal law you know, framework, whether it was compensation for victims, whether it was a framework that could also guarantee that all the issues connected basically with exploitation of individuals would be tackled um, at the universal uh, level, but also then at the regional one. Um, I also used actually a case study, so I was looking actually at slave auctions happening in uh, uh, Libya in uh, November of 2017 to consider how uh, this was mislabeled in the end. So an issue that actually um, involved uh, basically the selling of individuals uh, um, was then uh, taken into consideration uh, by uh, the uh, Security Council as an issue of human trafficking in the end. While actually you might miss the elements that might lead us to say that this was human trafficking. 
and what it based on the evidence that we have, this was not a crime uh, in practice. And so since uh, the cases were definitely cases of slavery, uh, or also the selling of individuals, it would be probably appropriate to go back also to our slavery framework since it is outdated to see whether this can be um, uh, updated uh, in any way. Um, if you look at that, uh, there are also a variety of other issues. Whether we discuss actually about some uh, traditional uh, forms of exploitation still existing in some countries of the world, obviously I have in mind cases of uh, Mauritania, for instance, uh, or Niger, or whether again um, we talk about situations in terms of early forced marriages, um, which at times again might not fit um, the framework that we have in place in terms of human trafficking or maybe forced labor, but again, maybe they would fit the one of slavery and the practice is similar to slavery, then all these issues tell to us that probably we need to reconsider the legal frameworks that we have in place um, for the purpose of updating uh, these um, issues. And this is why I came out actually with this proposal, which was not very much well accepted by the representative of the European Commission during uh, the hearing at the European Parliament, uh, which was actually the idea of drafting a new treaty. I know that drafting a new treaty can be burdensome. Um, it's a long process, then we need obviously to be promoted by states, which either states are in, or still, you know, proposal which comes from the academia, you know, from the systemic community of experts, probably uh, it's not going to be effective. But still, again, I wanted to uh, promote this um, possibility and then see whether there can be a way of bringing in states um, to generate interest actually in uh, this possibility and see whether this can bring a change in the uh, Obviously, it would be also particularly important to have a human rights framework in mind, an intersectional approach, approach an approach based on gender mainstreaming, and then you know, an approach in which you can have a monitoring mechanism in place that actually today is lacking if you look at uh, at the uh, um, uh, conventions on slavery. Um, then I um, examined also uh, some of the policy developments uh, because the European Parliament had already um, promoted in 2013 the adoption of a previous study on this issue, on the issue of contemporary forms of slavery, and the study had been drafted by Professor Kevin Bates and Professor Zoe Cobb. Um, and uh, somehow they wanted me to update that study in respect of, of the policy developments after 2013. So for obvious reasons, the first issue that I looked at uh, was the Sustainable Development Goals. And then we also have a look at the goal Global Compact on Migration in particular. But for both of them, I was particularly critical. Um, in the Sustainable Development Goals, actually, we have three um, goals in particular um, dealing with the issue of uh, contemporary forms of slavery. Um, however, if you look at the indicators, so the way in which we're going to assess progress uh, for them, this is particularly problematic. So we have certain issues um, and there are also some choices that only are difficult to understand. For instance, in the Sustainable Development Goal um, uh, 8.7, um, uh, uh, which is the, probably the most important one, uh, from our perspective, it seems that actually uh, there is a pledge to end child labor in all its forms by 2025, uh, which is five years uh, in advance in respect of the deadline of 2030 for all the other sustainable development goals. If we go back to the estimates, we have an estimate which is coming from the International Labor Organization of 152 million children in child labor in the world, which is far more. I know that it's difficult to compare estimates, so I will need to do that even if uh, probably this is more a guesstimation than an estimation of the issues. But uh, the general estimate that we have for contemporary forms of slavery is that we have approximately 40.3 million people in other contemporary forms of slavery. So, Honestly, this is also problematic, and it's not clear whether this will be met or not. The ILO itself uh, somehow recently stated that probably in respect to the issue of child labor, we're not going to meet that deadline. We 
which is particularly problematic because we also have an issue of agenda setting and then not being able to meet certain, you know, fundamental um, challenging problems, you know, of humanity. So then the issue might be what can we do to overcome actually the problem of setting, you know, certain standards and then not being able to, uh, to meet them. Um, if you look at the partnerships, alliances, and whatever else is being created for meeting these challenging, these challenges, um, I'm sorry, this is also problematic um, because actually, for instance, the European Union participates only to the European Union UN Spotlight Initiative, which is aimed at eliminating violence against women and um, which actually has to do with Sustainable Development Goal Number Five Point Two but not actually with the other sustainable development goals connected with the area of contemporary forms of slavery. So um, the problem again of fragmentation and of having multiple agendas or priorities and how actually some of the actors might uh, work only with a few others um, is problematic in this, in this respect. Um, and I try to quickly get uh, to some uh, conclusions um, <clears throat> because I think I'm already running out of time, even if you're extremely kind with me, but I am sure that I'm already out of uh, uh, time. So um, I was also then looking at the European Union framework for external action, which is particularly problematic because there is a lack actually of a coherent framework. And so we have a variety of initiatives but they lack a coherent framework within which these activities could be conducted. Um, so what I would like to uh, tell you actually as a conclusion um, <clears throat> is to go back uh, to uh, the uh, beginning of uh, the fight against uh, slavery, uh, quoting William Wilberforce, uh, Wilberforce, who was actually the British Member of Parliament, who promoted actually the uh, legislation in the UK uh, for abolishing slavery and was part actually of this uh, anti-slavery movement. And what he said um, is that actually you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you didn't know. So my call here to the all of you experts, but also to the students, all the others also from international organizations, is to try to be united. Maybe many of you, especially maybe the students or others who are watching us uh, on YouTube as well, uh, we're not aware of these issues and maybe didn't think that contemporary forms of slavery are a fundamental problem in our world today. Uh, this is what, for instance, some of my students uh, tell me at the beginning of the course. I didn't even know that this existed, you know. <clears throat> so once that we know that these problems exist and that we have fundamental problems in tackling them, then obviously the next step uh, um, is to be united in a way or another for finding solutions. Thank you very much. Professor Scarpa, you put on the table a uh, very important issue. Then in discussion and uh, made, uh, after in the questions, uh, I have a set of questions already for you. The second speaker, Parosha, Professor Parosha Chandran, of uh, Professor of Practice in Modern Slavery Law, uh, King's College London, and uh, I read it, I in 2050 she was presented with the Trafficking in Person Hero Award by the 10th the US Secretary of State, John Kerry. That's important. Sorry for my English. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm grateful to all my uh, distinguished colleagues from John Cabot University for inviting me here today. It's, uh, absolute pleasure and I'm uh, delighted to see so many of you here to support the uh, extremely important work of Professor Scarpa and her devotion uh, to this subject and her attention to raising um, the parapet uh, issues that need to be discussed. So modern slavery, contemporary slavery, you know, that I find them interchangeable as terms. So just as much as the report is contemporary forms of slavery, I would also call it modern forms of slavery. Um, that's my only distinguishing feature uh, from Professor Scarpa, because I would like to say that I admire and I endorse her findings. 
I've been a practitioner at the bar for 22 years, and so my position as a, bar uh, as a barrister has always been at the forefront of trying to represent victims and to understand what their needs are and to try to agitate for reform, like I hold up a piece of law, like a, a, an instrument, and, and see if it's watertight, if it, if it fits. And if it doesn't, I've been able to bring cases that have helped mould and shape law and policy uh, in various, in various uh, different um, regimes. So I, I look at it from that perspective, and it's a great honour for me when King's College London appointed me their first professor of practice in modern slavery law just last um, summer. For, for me, um, I just wanted to start from where we came from in Britain, because we have this modern slavery act, but what, it, what is it about, and, and where did the, the term come from? When I wrote a book back in 2011 called um, Human Trafficking Handbook, recognizing trafficking and what I called modern day slavery in the UK. The reason why I called it modern day slavery, um, and that this was before there was any branding of modern slavery as it came to pass, was because when I was looking at the case law on slavery, I could see this tension between the 1926 uh, convention definition of slavery, which requires the exercise of the powers of ownership over a person, and the modern day condition of being held as a slave where there is no de jure ownership over a person. And um, I studied in detail uh, a wonderful judgment uh, of the Australian uh, Federal High Court called Town in 2008 uh, during the writing of the book, which really looked at how a person who is a victim of trafficking can be determined to be a victim of slavery if one is applying the definition of slavery under the 1926 um, convention. And the bottom line was, and I always get to the bottom line before a judge knocks me off my perch, uh, and says, no, Ms. Chandra, let's, let's, let's somebody else speak, is they said that it was really treating a person as if they are your property. So it's not just um, colloquial language. This is set in a judgment that the interpretation of the 1926 Slavery Convention can boil down to treating a person as if you owned them. So I think that's really a very good place to start from. Um, in Britain, we actually um, criminalised trafficking for sexual exploitation in 2003, um, and then we recognised that that was the only form of exploitation we criminalised. So the following year, we then brought in other legislation to criminalise all forms of exploitation. A case of mine called Patience's Case in 2008 exposed a legislation gap, whereby although we had criminalised the bringing into Britain of a person for the purpose of exploitation, we had never criminalised the holding of a person in slavery or servitude or requiring a person to perform forced labour. Now it was interesting because of course we present ourselves as having been at the absolute uh, forefront of the anti-slavery uh, uh, doctrine by having abolished the transatlantic slave trade, but that was the transatlantic trading of slaves. Human trafficking uh, as um, I'll learn it, a uh, UN Special Rapporteur uh, knows much more about than me, um, has been dynamic in raising so many of these issues to the, to the front of one's mind because it's set in place through treaty law, um, an enforcement mechanism, uh, an interest in monitoring, and therefore accountability. More importantly, when I was looking at the international conventions just as a lawyer in various different cases I brought or tried to bring, when I thought what I saw was that each international convention, even if we go back to the soft law of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, to the ICCPR, and we look at the ECHR, the language, including in the Slavery Convention, including in um, the uh, Forced Labour Convention, is the prohibition on a particular conduct. Now, in our minds, we might flip that 
to be that's criminal. But unless you legislate a prohibition into your criminal law, you haven't actually got a crime. So that's something that I wanted to come and say today, which is the idea of having a treaty that can criminalize conduct that goes beyond what is already criminalized under international treaty law is an extremely important starting point for the next level of discussion. Um, that case I told you about that exposed the legislation gap, Patience's case, we responded immediately to that. And so within a few months, we had what was called Section 71 of the Coroners and Justice Act of 2009, which actually did what it said on the tin. It criminalized the holding of a person in slavery or servitude or requiring them to perform forced labor. And then when our modern slavery bill was going through parliament, the real emphasis behind that, or one of them, was to get those three pieces of different legislation, the sex trafficking legislation, the all forms of exploitation on trafficking, and the forced labor and slavery legislation in one piece of legislative <coughs> document. So the consolidation process. And of course, along with that came so many other ideas that we got something that was uh, half, halfway there to, to being good, but uh, a start, I would say. This is um, where the branding came in, in a modern slavery act. So whoever decided that it was a good idea, um, and whether or not it was a good idea, it at least encapsulated the different forms of contemporary slavery that had been now criminalized in Britain. Now I know in a lot of countries, there's still no freestanding criminal law against holding a person in slavery or servitude and requiring them to perform forced labor. And also, we also should look at the plight of children because the worst forms convention under the ILO scheme um, prohibits, again, I say the language, um, the use of a child in armed conflict or sexual exploitation or the use of a child in the manufacture of drugs. And yet the tension can be, if we're using the human trafficking legislation, that unless we can convince a court, and I'm talking from a victim's perspective, that the child was recruited, transported, transferred, received, or harbored for the purpose of one of those forms of exploitation, we haven't got a hope of protecting that child or that person. Now, some of these uh, are controversial and some are less controversial. So a country is probably more akin to immediately accepting the criminalization needs to occur of using a child for sexual exploitation <coughs> than using a child for manufacture of drugs. And yet what we found in the human trafficking field is that traffickers are increasingly using victims for illegal, unlawful activities. It propels their profit. And so in some of my cases, when I was trying to um, bring the non-punishment cases in the human trafficking field to overturn and quash the criminal convictions of Vietnamese children in Britain who had been trafficked into the country or across the country for the purposes of, of marijuana cultivation, um, then there was often a tension of the court, by the courts as to whether or not to accept that these um, children were victims of crime when, of course, they are committing the crime themselves. These are just a few ideas. I have a few more minutes to just uh, give you maybe a few more um, points. When we look at um, different other forms of exploitation, we might have forced begging, um, the use of people, vulnerable people, as well as children in armed conflict, for example, um, the early and the forced marriages. Whilst the human trafficking treaties and treaties require the criminalization of one of those five acts for the purpose of exploitation, they don't require the criminalization of every form of exploitation. And yet, that is where the gap exists 
And so one of the recommendations by Professor Scarpa that aligns to her theory and a very practical solution of having a new treaty is that once you have treaties, you can have then the framework of protection that goes with it that enables the identification of the victim. Because without the law, you can't identify. And without the identification, you can't protect. So these are just my starting um, points. I would like to say um, that, again, I admire and endorse the findings of Professor Scarpa and her work in this field. I find that her examination of the concept uh, couldn't be more uh, pressing. Um, and that these should set the framework for discussions in times to come. Uh, and uh, I, it's my true privilege to uh, be here today. Thank you. I'm going to now to the floor to Maria Grazia Bernalinaro, who is a rapporteur, but most important, huge in the civil court. So every day she has to deal with such cases. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I would like to say, first of all, that I'm proud that our Silvia is the doctor of this very uh, excellent report and prestigious report. Um, describing uh, in, a, in very convincing uh, you know, terms the state of play of uh, the legal, concerning the legal framework of a number of legal notions uh, and the state of play of, of the discussion and describing it, and I agree completely, in terms of lack of clarity with, with negative consequences in practice in terms of uh, cooperation between the different uh, actors uh, in terms of uh, data collection, in terms of uh, identification of uh, priorities. And I think that, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, identifying uh, problems is the first step <laughs> to, find, uh, to find good solutions. So thank you very much, Sylvia, for, uh, for your excellent work. I, I'd like just to um, comment very, very briefly about this state of play. Uh, a major trend, for sure, uh, is a, a sort of a shift toward the concept of the notion of slavery at the international level for different reasons, in mean, uh, part uh, in political reasons, uh, uh, in, part, uh, in part because of, of uh, the excellent work of scholars uh, you know, showing the, uh, the fact that the concept of slavery is, a, is, an act, is very uh, you know, relevant uh, today. Um, and of course, uh, as, a, as a UN mandate holder on trafficking, I would like to say, first of all, that I don't want to condone or to promote, uh, even worse, any con standard confrontation. Uh, on the contrary, I have always said that uh, these different legal standards should reinforce each other and should contribute to what is the most important and the essential of so the protection and promotion of the rights of uh, exploited persons, because in practice what we are talking about in any case is extreme or severe exploitation of people in different, uh, in different areas, as uh, Panosha as has uh, said. Personally speaking, uh, I'm aware of the difficulty uh, related to uh, all this standards. In practice, um, I, I have always advocated, for example, uh, for the criminalization of trafficking itself, but also for the autonomous criminalization of all forms of exploitation, including in, in the definition to make you know, life easier for practitioners, especially prosecutors uh, 
uh, law enforcement prosecutors and judges. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, each notion uh, can be used uh, in uh, different areas uh, uh, with very good results. For example, I think that slavery is a very strong concept for advocacy, especially in countries in which there is a strong legacy of the anti-slavery anti -slavery movement. It is a strong concept for advocacy among businesses in the private sector for good and bad reasons. Uh, the bad reason being the fact that uh, you know, they have a feeling that they are you know, struggling uh, for, for, the, for the good, that they are combating a very historical, uh, you know, uh, bad, um, bad issue uh, such as slavery, uh, but also for, for bad reasons uh, in the sense that um, you know, slavery is seen as, a, as a something exceptional, not really questioning the, uh, the business model as such. So there are, uh, you know, um, uh, complex uh, um, political implications <laughs> in the use of, uh, um, of every standard. Uh, trafficking, I think, that uh, captures uh, um, situations of abuse of a position of uh, vulnerability, in which there is no significant deprivation of freedom of movement, uh, you know, through the use of this important concept of uh, abuse of a position of vulnerability, it clearly shows that it is linked with migration issues. Mm. Uh, because it is true that vulnerabilities, social vulnerabilities, are very often linked with the situation of uh, uh, migrants, uh, sometimes in irregular, in irregular situations. Uh, so um, on the other hand, slavery I mean, um, seems to be the only um, the only topic uh, on the social agenda of uh, governments. Um, not very willing to question uh, systemic aspects uh, of uh, of the problem of uh, of exploitation, uh, and of course, uh, you know, slavery makes it easier to stay away from difficult issues uh, related to migration policies. Uh, on the other hand, trafficking has been used on a systematic way, in a systematic way by governments to justify restrictive migration policies. Mm -hmm. you, you can hear very, very often uh, talk of politicians about uh, you know, fighting against traffickers, which means for them, you know, uh, preventing people from from entering the country. And of course, an anti trafficking uh, policy should be exactly the opposite. Should be, uh, you know, a policy um, aiming to, uh, you know, protect uh, the rights of these people. So, um, we are uh, in a situation in which uh, the, the most important aspect of what we are discussing right now uh, is the fact that under the three standards, uh, the rate of identification and protection of exploited people is very low. Yeah. This is sadly the reality. This is partly due to the fact that uh, interpretation and implementation of these three standards is difficult. <coughs> there are interpretation issues, Russia. Uh, Parosha said this, uh, that are common actually. Um, situations in which the subjugation of a person is achieved through uh, psychological manipulation, which very often, uh, very often uh, happens in, in reality. And uh, of course, uh, you know, question these situations, question uh, the concept of voluntariness under the forced labor standard, the concept of uh, power, uh, powers attached to the right of prop, uh, property, and questions, of course, the notion of a position of position vulnerability, which is very rare 
so the common problem is a human rights problem, a human rights issue. Um, and I would like to say that uh, you know, Cynthia has been a visionary <laughs> in her report, uh, having worked for the European Commission, and it, I'm not surprised that <laughs> the reaction <laughs> was not so open, uh, in the sense that uh, you know, European institutions will I love Europe. Uh, I am a believer. Uh, but I have to say that sometimes the European institutions are very conservative <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a general approach. But I would try to, I would like to try to be even more visionary, <laughs> even more visionary. After all, as I said, what is the common issue? Mm -hmm. Is exploitation. So why don't we try to shift the focus? on exploitation. <coughs> Frankly speaking, I think that uh, especially for slavery and slavery uh, trafficking is more recent. Still, there is a lot of uh, uh, you know, legal experience and practical experience also on trafficking. There is too much history to think that uh, everything can be you know, unified in a, in a in an only uh, legal, uh, legal framework. But exploitation, yes. <coughs> exploitation is common to all these concepts. And uh, we should try to think about a sort of uh, minimum, uh, minimum protection of exploited persons. Uh, I don't know if uh, in terms of a new treaty or in other terms, but I think this, this could be uh, a very good way to bring together uh, all uh, you know, uh, people uh, dealing with for slavery, trafficking and slavery to, uh, to uh, tackle uh, what is the essential human rights of exploited people. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Professor Sajan Marinado, you put on the table other issues, and uh, we are going to discuss. Uh, there are a lot of open uh, issues uh, to clarify more and to go more in depth. So now the floor is yours. Questions and answers, please.
considered the cleaner behavior and so on and so forth. So uh, I think this is the most important aspect uh, uh, somehow that came out from this conversation. On the one side, you know, differences in, uh, in addressing the issue among the member states and uh, the common denominator that uh, me, Professor Gianna Rinaro uh, pointed out on, uh, you know, exploitation, because at the end of the day, <laughs> I mean, it's true, I mean, the common denominator among uh, all the, you know, either criminal behaviors or, uh, uh, you know, legislation and differences and, and uh, uh, levels of, uh, 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 you know, how the member states deal with the treaties is uh, the exploitation. So thank you very much um, for this. I just wanted, to, uh, and I leave the floor for questions to the students. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I wanted to congratulate with uh, Professor Scarpa for uh, the study, which is quite interesting and also very inspiring. And I would like also to congratulate with the panelists for the very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Um, of course, there is, uh, how to say, a plus of having uh, a framework that puts uh, all together. Uh, but I think that, uh, as it was put forward by the, the special rapporteur, uh, it's, um, it's quite complicated. Unfortunately, we are not even uh, in, uh, how to say, in the right time for uh, undertaking, uh, how to say, endeavors to revisit uh, some treaties and some conventions that I mean, for which are curved in stone. Uh, and uh, I would like to share with you an experience I had a few years ago while drafting an international instrument when we put forward contemporary forms of slavery. There were so many states that opposed to it. And they challenged the, the secretary. I worked for the International Labour Organization, saying, OK, show us in which instrument this is uh, indicated. So. We had to, I mean, it was an attempt to, how to say, bring together different elements of, uh, of slavery, of what you call the uh, contemporary forms of slavery, but I can assure you that it's not an easy undertaking in, uh, in these days. <laughs> True is that uh, uh, for operational purposes, uh, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, having a common framework, I think this is possible. I don't see it uh, uh, that uh, difficult. It's mostly a matter of goodwill, both at international and national levels. Uh, but I think that in most of the, if not in all, uh, although in a very traditional way, as the professor of the King's College said, uh, we, we, are, we have the instruments that help us to tackle uh, the issue relating to contemporary forms of slavery. True is also that, uh, as uh, the special rapporteur mentioned, uh, exploitation would somehow uh, bundle everything together. Uh, but also there are a number of, of, uh, to say, of concerns that need to be discussed, uh, particularly where you move to implement uh, these, uh, these instruments, that is to say to the, to the national level, because uh, I tend to think that, uh, you know, the important aspects of uh, modern slavery in many, many, many countries are nowadays relating to migration. Uh, and uh, there is more, let's put it uh, this way, there is more interest in addressing, uh, you know, different aspects of modern slavery, which somehow are the tip of the iceberg, without looking into the nine tenths that they are below the surface. Yeah. So this is also, you know, something whereby, uh, you know, th th this, these um, pieces of research uh, uh, are quite useful and, uh, you know, should also be, how to say, furthered uh, in order for us to have uh, more uh, 
uh, how to say, tools uh, to tackle these, uh, these issues. There is also, uh, I mean, I, I talk, for instance, it was, there was a reference to the Child Labor Convention. Uh, true that by 2025, uh, it's quite difficult to uh, eradicate or eliminate child labor, but it's also true that uh, in, uh, since the, the convention was adopted in 1999, Child labor has lowered by from 2,250 million of children in, wor in the worst forms of child labor to 152 million. And there we have, uh, or there are also uh, instruments to, for daily monitoring and you know, identifying what responses uh, 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 how to say, could be put forward. So many countries have have done this. There has been a commitment at the highest level uh, within the country and uh, uh, you know, after a short period of time there has been a drastic drop uh, in, uh, in the numbers of child labor. True is also that other countries, uh, I don't want to, you know, to point to any country, but even industrialized countries, uh, as we speak, they do not have uh, statistics of child labor. They do not have statistics on forced labor or other forms of modern slavery. So how can, uh, how to say, we uh, tackle the problem if even we don't know what is its size, its dimension, in which areas, and so forth. So I think that there too, uh, I'm thinking of, you know, combining uh, the, uh, the definitions that have been uh, re revised and looked into by your study into operational, uh, operational tools and mechanisms, I mean, in terms also of collaboration, not only at the international, but also at the national levels. Thank you very much. Some other questions? We, we have one here. One, okay. Please uh, pay attention to the time. Of course. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I need to preface the question by telling you that I'm a former United Nations Chief Security Advisor who spent 15 years working in Africa and the Middle East. My question relates specifically to child soldiers. I spent a lot of time working with child soldiers, particularly in Sierra Leone, in the year 2000, both before and after the Revolutionary United Front invaded the same <coughs> time in May 2000. How does the legal ramifications and political ramifications and international ramifications, all of this relate to the pointy end of the spear in the field where people like me work about bringing people that exploit children as child soldiers ultimately to justice? Because it didn't happen in Sierra Leone. And it didn't happen because the United Nations brokered a peace deal in Lomé with Forty Sanko that ignored the issue. What's being done to address that today? Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, another question there, we answer only. Good evening and thank you guys for being here. Um, European countries or a few European countries are considering to partner with China for their Belt Road Initiative. How can you ensure that European tax dollars don't go to Chinese forced labor in building this project if these countries do decide to partner, these European countries do decide to partner with China for this initiative? Great. Hello, uh, my question then uh, your answer. My question is, uh, you asked how to act united. And uh, I ask you, uh, what is your experience as a lawyer, as a scholar, uh, in your relations with the civil society organization or the main actors dealing against slavery? And uh, an example could be this. You remember there was the case of Nokia. Nokia used a child for building shoes. There was a huge protest all over the world, and Nokia uh, 
Nike. Nike, yeah, sorry, Nike. And uh, uh, finish with this type of exploitation. Uh, why we don't ask uh, a label that in each product say, make sure that it's not produced by child, ch children, uh, and so on. Something that uh, illustrates that uh, make sure that uh, we are in good position. It's a good product because no exploitation of it. Please answer our professor. Please. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll give some my snapshot answers to give the questions. Um, is that okay. Sure. Okay. So, so on child soldiers. Um, the, you're absolutely right that there was really no UN focus in the field on child soldiers. But you'll be surprised to know that there actually was no training for UN field officers on human trafficking in conflict situations at all, Experience. until just now. So I was on the group of experts with the UNODC in, um, well, last year, I think it was like maybe in the autumn, uh, and their guidance has just was published uh, recently, which is the first operational guidance for UN field officers, uh, specifically looking at um, identifying vulnerable groups of persons, including child soldiers, in the field uh, as being victims of human trafficking. And so it will cover for you know, the kind of climate and disasters that we're also seeing a lot of, where there are displaced groups of people who um, are then vulnerable to being trafficked because uh, of the circumstances, just as much as armed conflict, uh, just as much as um, other types of, of, of conflict and, and displacement. Um, in relation to, uh, it's not a perfect answer, but these are just my snapshot answers to what are some very serious issues that you've all raised. So if they're getting some training now, it's a massive improvement it is, it is. where we were before. And there was an operational guidance, and now there is. So this is a, a game changer, potentially. Well, let's say it's a game changer. Let's make it a game changer. Um, in re relation to um, uh, corporate liability, um, it's very important uh, for um, states, EU member states, that have opted into the EU Tracking Directive 2011-36 EU to appreciate that there is a requirement of corporate liability. Now, corporate is too grand a word. It actually includes provisions on the liability of legal persons, okay, as opposed to natural persons. And so this actually requires member states to ensure that the criminalization of human trafficking which is Article 2, and of the participatory patriarchs of aiding, abetting, um, attempts, etc., which is Article 3, are made subject also to legal liability of businesses. There is also a provision, which is critical, which is called using the services of traffic person. And so that, again, is a legal obligation on EU member states. So if you weren't aware of that and you are aware of it now, then these things need to come up to the surface when it comes to exposing what states are getting away with because there is an obligation, it's a legal obligation, and there needs to be something done about it. Um, in relation to how to act united, the only example I can give you that I know well of uh, in a snapshot is the case of Thailand, uh, which recently, in the last few years, was well exposed for having used slave labour on the seas for the production of corns in particular. And the horror stories of the uh, mariners are so extreme because on land, if you're a traffic victim, you've at least got ground under your feet. But on a ship, there is nowhere to go. Now, the combination of a number of elements, and I don't say any one was greater than the other, but it was at least a starting point. Firstly, there was public absolute disgust when they when we understood that prawns were being fetched for our supermarket shelves with users late labor and immediately there was a public uh, outcry that this was not correct or acceptable secondly or not secondly there's no list to it 
The US State Department, in its trafficking in persons reporting, which goes on every year, blacklisted Thailand to tier three, which made it therefore no longer eligible for trade. Now that was a hit in the wallet and incorporated therefore an absolute necessity to respond. What then happened was that there was a realization that there were people in government who were committed in the Thai system to seeking change, but they needed assistance and help to do that. And so inevitably, that, well not inevitably, but I can tell you that that thing did happen. And so t Thailand has then been able to get up. Now another gap in the law which relates to contemporary forms of slavery was that the, I thought was that the cases couldn't be adequately prosecuted because they were not human trafficking cases. And you'll be surprised to know, and hopefully glad to know, that last week I heard that Thailand has now criminalised forced labour and slavery as freestanding criminal offences. Just a contemporary example of slavery and its operation. Thank you very much. Um, so concerning child soldiers, I uh, just want to reinforce what Parosha said. Actually, uh, I consider uh, this a form of trafficking because there is recruitment, you know, by force or abuse of vulnerability and exploitation. And uh, uh, it is true that uh, until a few years ago, nobody was really making the link between trafficking and conflict. So I reported uh, twice to the General Assembly on this uh, you know, linkage between uh, uh, trafficking and conflict. Now UNODC issued uh, a very good uh, uh, you know, report uh, on, uh, on this. And it, it is true that this has been the beginning of a very uh, positive process, uh, you know, leading, I hope, to a better uh, a better understanding and action, better action on this uh, on this issue, uh, and this issue is particularly important. Uh, um, it is particularly important to deal with this issue in a correct way, because after all, the real problem is the rehabilitation of these children after they have been rescued, and uh, this process is very often very difficult and not always uh, dealt with in a correct way by governments uh, which tend to detain these children and so, sometimes we don't know in uh, what conditions and what is the outcome of such an action. So basically treating these children not as victims but as uh, perpetrators. Or a very or dangerous victim. Exactly. Concerning uh, supply chains, I have to say that we, we are at the very beginning of a long way. Um, actually, I will uh, report, I will focus uh, um, in my next report on uh, uh, trafficking for labor, exploitation, and I will deal also with this, uh, with this issue. Um, there has been already a lot of attention by my mandate and other UN mandates uh, on this, but I have to say that uh, you know legislation so far in the world is limited to a few pieces of legislation. We can count on one hand. Actually, there are four. Actually, there are four. Very, very badly implemented. Um, now there is the. the the French law uh, of uh, 2017, which is the most uh, you know, progressive, advanced, and more binding, uh, more, more binding legislation. So we will monitor uh, the results. The reality is that there are a few, uh, few no, there are many voluntary initiatives in the private sector sectors, big companies established uh, a multi-stakeholder initiatives uh, um, or industry-based initiatives for, you know, to promote social compliance. Uh, the results are not very satisfactory, uh, just, to, just to say, uh, I mean, you know, even the label uh, that you uh, evoked, uh, which is of course one of the 
uh, tools so we can use uh, uh, actually have been found in, uh, in a few okay. cases, uh, you know, hiding a uh, very bad situation of exposition. So we are at the very beginning, we have to refine and have more sophisticated tools and uh, I think that uh, we can act united, <laughs> united um, you know, to, to achieve uh, better results in terms of insights. Please, the conclusion. Yes, if I can quickly also answer to these questions because they open up uh, a word actually. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, if you look at that, these are particularly important. I want to go back also to your comment on the concept on the using exploitation or another firm. Honestly, I'm not against the concept of exploitation, definitely I'm sure. Many that you might remember when I published my first monograph uh, in 2008, which was published by uh, Oxford University Press, um, I was having this a uh, broad action interpretation of the trafficking framework was my first uh, monograph was on human trafficking. And when looking at this concept of exploitation, which is included in the definition of human trafficking, I was already, first of all, attempting to interpret in a way uh, already all the other concepts that are within the concept of exploitation itself, and then broadening up the focus, so since the definition remains open in the trafficking protocol, to other forms of exploitation, some of which also ended up being included in the 2011 uh, number 36 directive of uh, the European Union. So issues uh, such as um, criminal activities, um, forced banking, for instance, uh, some types of early forced marriages. So some issues can be tackled also, you know, through the trafficking framework and then the concept of exploitation. Obviously, as you say, if you keep out the concept of exploitation from the trafficking definitions can be broadened up even farther. So I see your point. Um, I have two fears in this respect, um, but I am open to obviously discussing and finding a solution on how to label eventually this new term. Um, the first one actually has to do, uh, and I want to wrap it since I'm a little bit obsessed with slavery. But if you look at the concept of slavery, as Prosha was uh, correctly mentioning, uh, as we said, the definition included in the 1926 Convention says that we talk about the rights of ownership exercised on individuals, which might also mean a selling and buying, I go back to the Libyan case, the slave auctions, and not anything else than that. You sell some money and you get cash out of that. Um, it's true that within the trafficking protocol, slavery is included over there, but there might be a certain disconnect in the way in which you look at the concept of exploitation um, thinking that you're going to somehow, you know, not only get cash by selling someone, but then exploit also the person afterwards. Huh? I guess that our analysis of the term exploitation somehow implies also that then the person will work, exactly. or will be sexually exploited, or there will be something else happening afterwards. And that's why I was pushing a lot also on not losing the element of slavery within the all of that, because that's also important, okay? in terms of also tackling some of these issues that not always are easily, um, you know, coming out in what we think when we think about the concept of exploitation. Then again, exploitation, um, I have in mind, for instance, uh, the uh, report of the Secretary General, if you talk about specifically sexual exploitation, the distinction between sexual exploitation and abuse. So according to me, it's a term that might have certain problems. Huh? Um, in a way, which can be solved uh, by you know, emphasizing exactly what we mean by that and probably leaving the door open to certain issues which might risk uh, being uh, um, taken outside of that uh, framework. Um, for what concerns then the uh, study, yes, it's true that I was pushing for a new treaty, um, which I think is you know, one, of the, one of the way forward, it's not the only one. The other idea, obviously I uh, was promoting and pushing for is for customary law, uh, which means a study is really needed in terms of uh, the uh, rules that we have within the system and exactly how they are interpreted within customary law, which is actually, uh, as you know, um, uh, you know, customary rules are fundamental rules within the system and written rules, but that apply and are binding for all the states of the world, which would give to us also, you know, so then, uh, you know, in another legacy for saying that states are bound then to respect certain standards. So, so if we can advance, and probably there is room for advancing if we do a little bit of research on that, um, in that area too. Okay, so this was one of the two issues that I was pushing for. 
Um, I would like to thank uh, in particular uh, Mrs. Ale Alessandra Lucori O'Neill from UNIGRI for uh, her comment as well, and also uh, Mrs. Jenny Rosses from the ILO. This gives to me also a chance to thank, because probably we didn't do that before, uh, the three organizations who offer their patronage to uh, this conference, uh, which are actually the International Labour Organization, the Office of uh, the Representative of the European Commission in Rome, as well as the Eurispace Institute uh, that today is also represented by uh, Professor Richel. Um, two final comments on uh, the issue of child soldiers. Don't forget uh, that there was a special court for Sierra Leone, and some of the issues of child soldiers were actually dealt with, and we don't have time for getting into the details within that court, he was actually recruiting children uh, as child soldiers. Um, uh, if they are below 15, it's actually a war crime. Okay? So that was an issue which was actually uh, examined and taken into consideration by that court. I agree with you that probably more would have needed to be done in other ways, but still that was one of the things. Um, China, China is a giant, economically speaking, and so uh, the fear that then uh, human rights issues as well as contemporary slavery issues might end up, uh, uh, you know, being placed at a corner might be present. Uh, so that's why I want to go back uh, to my call to basically everybody to be, in a way or another, active, also in terms of our governments pushing for more responsible policies um, to be promoted. Huh? Uh, which is also, I guess, important. Right? This has to do with the issue of migration that somehow came out in many uh, ways. Um, final issue, uh, I'm not going to get into the details of the area of business and human rights. I think it's not by chance that none of the questions that the European Parliament asked to me had to do with that. So somehow, it did, you know, I mentioned that issue, but they didn't really get into the details. But that's another huge area, honestly. Uh, there is a process ongoing for the drafting of a new treaty on business and human rights, which is very interesting, honestly. So we go back to treaties, to standard setting, to how we can push states. But, you know, if you look it's at that, going also, going uh, well. it's, it's not going very well, it's true, because the European uh, Commission actually seems that we drew from, uh, you know, the discussions, which is problematic. But there is a zero draft. Uh, so uh, for the treaty and a protocol to the treaty, it's a first step. Huh? Obviously, it's not yet binding. It still has to be promoted, you know, at an international conference where then maybe states will um, eventually decide whether they want to sign and then ratify the treaty. But again, maybe these steps can be promoted if there is more and more knowledge about these issues, about also, you know, issues which are created by companies, business enterprises, and in particular, multinational. Uh, corporations. Huh? Uh, we talk a lot with my students in our courses about that. Um, because at times this is also not well known. Um, yeah. And this is also a particularly thorny issue that needs to be tackled. Thanks. And sorry. <laughs> 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 Thank you.